Hello, everybody, and welcome to Avid Reader Bookshop. Um, I'm Chrissy Neen. I am wearing my mask of um, one person per mic only -ness. Um, so uh, it is really great to see um, people's places. We've been running events here, masked and distanced for quite a while now, and it's just lovely to have a brief moment of being able to say hello in person. Um, so if you do want to see my face when I stop speaking in this, I'll take my mask off and say hello. Um, it's very exciting to be have you all here tonight. Um, a couple of things before we start, though. Um, we do have an outdoor toilet, which is probably easiest to access. Just be careful of the cord over there. But um, it's just out through there and in the corner. But there's also an upstairs toilet if you prefer to use that one. So that is the toilets for you. We also have some people who have joined us on Zoom. Um, sorry, I can't direct you to your toilet. Hopefully you know where that is. <laughs> For the people in the room, I hope you've availed yourself of the bar, which is a few of you have. Um, I think that will be open briefly afterwards as well for a final drink. So I'd like to um, start the, kick the event off. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area, the Agra and Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to note that we're going out on Zoom. So we're zooming onto the lands of many, many different Aboriginal people all around Australia. I'd like to pay my deepest respects to their elders and to acknowledge this is Aboriginal land, always was, always will be, sovereignty was never ceded. So on that note, um, I'd like to hand over to Samantha Lidley, who is a curator of Australian art at Queensland Art Gallery of Modern, of Modern Art. So everybody please welcome Samantha. I also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, recognise that it was never ceded, and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. So, I'm here tonight to discuss a book that allows us, as the great American biographer Jim Malcolm has expressed, the rapture of a first hand encounter with another's lived experience. With me are the author of the book, which will be smart and shoe. And the subject, Dr. Fiona Foley. I've just been doing some work with Fiona Foley, so please forgive me if I slip off and somehow manage to do that. So, Louise is an arts writer who has contributed regularly to national newspapers, art magazines, and blogs. Her monographs include The Pain Persists, Mindy Ivory Sculpture, which accompanied the exhibition that she curated for the UQ Art Museum. Louise's biographical project. Fiona Foley, Provocateur and Art Life, which we're talking about tonight, was written as part of the PhD awarded by the University of Queensland in 2019. Fiona is a bachelor woman, an artist, an author, and curator who has exhibited widely within Australia and overseas. Retrospectives of her work include Fiona Foley, Veiled Paradise, Who Are These Strangers and Where Are They Going? and Fiona Foley, Forbidden. Fiona was awarded a PhD from Princeton University in 2017. Her work is held by major national art institutions and occupies public spaces across the country. So please welcome our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start by reading an extract from Louise's biography from the chapter Embodied. I stand for a minute, looking out at the flat horizon, the sea which extends into infinity. Fiona stands, thigh deep, a few metres from the shore. It's cold, she says. I follow her out, and it is, but when she dives under the water's surface, I do too. The sea is beautifully clear and calm over the sandy bottom. I float, immersed in blue. After a few minutes, I head back to the beach, wrap myself in a towel, and sit on the bank. Fiona is still swimming, cavorting like a dolphin, a small round frame, bobbing up and down, diving and resurfacing. <laughs> in her pleasure, I see the child that she was, 
to weeks every year on Dari in a time when the ocean functioned both as a place for fun and a refrigerant. These memories are encapsulated in the sea, her muscles, her lungs, and her antics celebrate the dinner. Louise is just one of the many provocative passages throughout the book, which is novel like in structure, especially in the use of description and narrative. Could you tell us about the methodology, which is probably best described as creative non fiction? Um, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Sorry, I'm just helping to start with. <laughs> um, so the book was structured really as a just like biography, I guess, because Fiona's an artist and she's produced such an incredible body of work and like the art to lead in. And because Fiona is an Aboriginal woman and I'm not, and I couldn't speak for Fiona, I needed and wanted her own work to speak. And I also, because she's a living biographical subject, um, I didn't want to invade her privacy, so I wanted only to write about things that she had made art about. So that meant I could talk about her life because she did that. <laughs> <laughs> but there were many things, very many areas that were It's just not fair. So I did give Louise a stack of love. <laughs> Thank God I didn't get into this book. <laughs> and because it was done under the university auspices, there was an ethical clearance process which took seven months um, to kind of get through. And of course, as part of that, you want to have final say about what it went into the book. So some things um, that were deemed too personal or too confronting came out, which is fair. Yeah, and so there's there's the art that informs the, sort of the basis of the work, and there's also built a creative response to the place and just the sort of process of, of working through those those histories. And I guess kind of above all of that was this sort of umbrella where I wanted to really talk to people about um, you know the Aboriginal experience in this place and take people who don't know about it and are not interested in it um, on a journey through, in a way, through Fiona's world and allow people to understand how important it is that Aboriginal um, sovereignty, so sovereignty is acknowledged um, to give them the, the benefit of um, some of the very political work that Fiona's made, but in a really gentle way, take them inside using that narrative non-fiction, very non-confronting stuff to take them to places they may not otherwise have a problem to go. Um, so this is kind of a question for both of you. It's a lack of friendship which dates back 20 years. Would you tell us a bit about how the relationship informed the writing of the book? Okay. You met you met um, originally around the time that you know, open about the fact she needs people to write about her work because if there's no catalogue you have an exhibition it's as though the show didn't happen so Fiona was kind of um, needing a new person to write about her work because Benjamin Ganokio who'd written the first sort of model of, um, had gone to America and so Simon Wright um, who was then the director of um, his Air Gallery introduced us and we had a bit of a conversation. Um, but then we just kept in touch, and I guess for years and years I was writing about Fiona's work. And the more I learned about Fiona and her background and her family, it's just such an incredible um, Queensland Australian story. And I did keep pitching it to Australian story, but couldn't get them interested. <laughs> so um, I just said to Fiona, it'd be really great if I could take some you know we could take some interviews and see where that goes and then after we only started doing the phd that seemed like a bad idea <laughs> and um it gave me a really great um, support structure to do a much bigger and so i can do a different work to anything i've ever done before 
and thank you. And Fiona, just from your point of view, um, you know, obviously it's important to develop a rapport with people who you collaborate with to get that work out there. And, and so what was that experience like for you? you know, obviously your friendship's really grown over the years. Well, we didn't realise we would have a lifelong friendship. I first contacted Louise and we met at QCA in the cafe and Louise was pregnant towards the end of her pregnancy with the twins and she was a really large woman <laughs> when I met her. <laughs> and the next time I saw her, she was looking like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, what a rapid change that is. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's my first impression of the week. And somehow, I don't know, we must have just kept in contact. And, and from time to time, she would write about my work and... So we've developed this lifelong friendship through trust and Louise is not judgmental. So I can bring her up and with a problem and she listens and um, understands the complexity of the issues because we've been in communication for a long, long time now. And you know, through that, she's got to meet colleagues and friends of mine and family members and particularly for writing for the publication and um she's always been even like you know she's an even person so you know she will laugh at my jokes which is really nice and i can take her anywhere so the trip we did or some of the trips we did to fraser Island. You sort of, because it's in nature, you find out about people's personalities quite quickly. So she's, when she's on the island, she's also this even personality. And um, so she's mixed in a lot of different circles of my friends and family, and um, she's just the same. So there's no airs or braces. She's just um, a good nature warm heart and person and that's what I love about her and I can have these deep and meaningful conversations and they, sometimes they can be on the surface quite and quite frivolous. So you know we you know she's captures all of that um, in the totality of that. So the biography is part of history, part social history and part family history. You know, this approach isn't new to you. As curator and author Michelle Cumbridge has identified, your artwork and in particular many of your photographs are a form of autoethnography. So, what was it like to be the subject of Louise's book? Difficult at times, but it didn't uh, ruin the friendship, which I was hoping, <laughs> hoping it wouldn't. So, we sometimes had to have difficult conversations because there are some things. I didn't want Louise to put in um, either the PhD or the end result of the publication. So I've read uh, the PhD when it was going through different stages twice and asked, you know, asked her to edit out aspects. And then before it was published this year, I went through it again and asked her to take out other things. And, which I was a little bit uncomfortable with because when you're in the public eye, there are things that will remain in the um, public domain for a long, long time. So I'm very, uh, I scrutinise all of that uh, with people writing because it's around for, you know, ever and a day and it's very hard to counteract that once it's out there. So um, I've gone through the book three times and um, so I haven't been able to read it since it's been published and but I was sitting on, I was saying to the two earlier this evening that I was sitting on the veranda this afternoon and I was reading different sections and I'm really grateful to Louise for what she has captured because um, particularly the early part of my career in the 80s, no one's really captured that yet. I was just going to say, it is important to acknowledge that it's a really, it is a really difficult thing to be the subject of a biography when you are alive. <laughs> and if you 
again is sort of a young woman. So um, it, you know, it's putting things right in front of your face that you may not even have seen. It's putting family dynamics um, out there in the public domain. And it's, you know, it, it's shining lights in places that you wouldn't don't have to go generally. So, um, yeah, it's a brave person who will take it on. So, Louise, you've either the challenges of authoring biography as a non Indigenous person, one of the biography about an Indigenous person. How have you gone about negotiating that territory? Um, well, look, it was really great to do it in a PhD program because, you know, before I had written so much about Aboriginal artists um, for years before I went through kind of the academy and had to learn about the kind of critical frame that you're in. And um, um, so really I just, I was just very careful, I think, to, um, to acknowledge the position I was in and be aware that I would make faux pas and that, um, it would be uncomfortable possibly and also just to never speak for Fiona um, or anybody else outside my cultural experience. Yeah so and you do that by you know using Fiona's words throughout the book and so your voice comes into a piano through that mechanism and of course you do in the in the opening section of the book talk about those just those things and how you're mindful to just you know, those things in, in relationship to the conversations that you're having with you know, so yeah and because I feel like it's like a micro history and a lot of the fine detail of you know things that we did that would otherwise never be documented yeah. um, are being captured and who knows whether or not that'll be valuable in future years um, but it's kind of necessarily provisional text so uh, I wrote it, I finished it at the end of 2018. Um, so much has changed since then. Um, so I guess I feel like I, it goes out, it's what it is, and you know, in future years, some of those things will be revised. Um, history is shifting under our feet. So the publication is timely in that it coincides with the recent reinstatement of the Indigenous name of the islanders known as ancestral claim to Gauri or Paradise, which the colonisers named Fraser Island after the Scottish woman Eliza Fraser, who was shipwrecked on the landmass for about five weeks in 1836. In fact, Gauri is the other main character in the book, I would argue, and it runs like a thread through your narrative beliefs. You write about the way Fraser's story has overshadowed and distorted the Indigenous history of the island, something perpetuated by non Indigenous artists such as Sidney Nolan and Patrick White to a degree. So um, that was something you kind of set out to address in a way or bring into the discussion through the writing. Well, going to Gary with Fiona um, was a whole other insight into Fiona so it would, and I guess that trip we did together in 2017 became another nice um, backdrop for the story unfolding and um, a different material came to the surface there. Um, so I agree it's a character in the book and um, it's completely, it's really wonderful that it, the true name of the island has been acknowledged but it's also kind of incredible it's taken such a long time. Yeah, has been making work about this issue for you know 30 years. Um, and many, many other people have highlighted it. So anyway, 2021 we got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still, yeah, it's just timely that it's sort of come to light right now. But it also really strikes you as you're reading the book and hearing about the long history of indigenous people on that land, and then you then think about five weeks of time and how that has sort of asserted itself in the history that we know, we're told of the official history of this country and it's, you don't make it in a point way, but you certainly make the point that you know, that that's sort of incongruity is just by The only you brought those Indigenous histories back into the picture through your art, as, as Louise has just said. Would you talk a minute about Gary's importance to you? 
Oh, where do you start? Um, well, I have to start with my mother because she's central to the story as well. Um, so she always um, impressed upon her four children and, you know, I'm the oldest of those four, that to be proud of our bachelor culture. And we would have regular holidays on the island. Um, and it was in a time when um, most families, particularly bachelor families, didn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle. So we used to have the luxury because my dad bought a second-hand four-wheel drive vehicle and um, spent the whole month on the island. And at that stage, um, we were teenagers travelling up from Sydney because we were educated in Sydney at one stage we left. Queensland because of their mixed marriage and um, and the racism more so that my father experienced being married to an Aboriginal woman and so we left the state and um, grew up more in Hornsby, um, Sydney and so we used to have two, two weeks of school holidays and then another two weeks would take off from school and have to just do homework away from school and so Gary was has always been central to our family in terms of like um, understanding that we are custodians for that country, understanding that we should be, you know, our mother instilled in us to be proud of that culture against adversity when it wasn't okay to be, um, let's say, um, Aboriginal and have a um, and be proud of your identity. And also, um, it was also her vision um, that drove the family to, for her to acquire land back on Gari, which was a 20 year lease of the Joe Bielke Peterson government. And she was a, a politician in her own right, where she would lobby different um, parliamentarians in the state of Queensland to help facilitate that. And um, so she was a driver in um, the totality of Gari, and it was always her vision to get land back. And we, she lived and breathed that project where she did get that uh, land back um, and try to establish Thorbine Education and Culture Centre. So, um, you know, it's just been a part of who we are and growing up in the, in the home was, you know, the publication, the first um, Aboriginal children, Indigenous children's book authored by my great uncle and auntie called The Legends of Moon and Jal. And I used to pour over those images and, and um, copy them. And somehow that influenced me, I believe, in my early uh, years to want to become an artist. So all of it has fed into who I am as a person and Gary has been central to all of that. So as you just mentioned, you know, the biography draws on the stories of your family, your late mother Shirley, your late father Barry, your siblings and your extended family. Louise, you draw that into the book and I just wondered if you talk briefly about the, the thinking behind that approach, obviously, it's um, a significant part of the story. Yeah, well, if you understand me, as she was saying, um, <clears throat> Shirley got land from the Bilky Peterson government on Gary. She was such a leader. That leadership, I believe, came down from, um, you know, the, that whole Aboriginal side of the family, um, Lee Wandana, who um, was the father of Fred Wandana. Um, who met Ethel Gribble, who was the sister of the missionary Gribble, who established the first um, mission, or he established it, but he ran the first mission on Gary. Um, and that that marriage of Fred Wandana and Ethel Gribble, when it happened, you know, in the late 1800s, it was such a huge thing for a white woman to marry a black man. I think that the Anglican Church changed their rules about <laughs> women working um, on missions as a result. So they did actually. They, the, the leadership is there, and Fiona's family, you know, 
Wolf Race and all the era who wrote the Legends of Money Jar were obviously leaders at their time. They just, you know, I think there was, it's fair to say, if Shirley grew up in grinding poverty, but she had really the ideas and nobody was going to tell her um, what not to do. So sadly, I didn't meet Shirley um, because she passed away well before um, this project got going. I did meet Barry um, a little while before his death, which was really very such an interesting meeting. Um, but you know, his, his experience probably wasn't even able to completely understand the um, level at which the owner works, but that's, you know, that's what, what happens with our parents often, you know, we see their expectations, we see their experience, um, and then Fiona's sister up there at Harvey Bay and um, Rowan, various places, um, Fiona's brother, and um, her other brother, Sean, just adds insight into who Fiona is and what that family experience was, and her brothers were able to talk to me about you know, how it was to grow up in that family and, you know, in a family every every child's experience can be so different, so that's always intriguing. Um, it was so important to kind of capture whatever family dynamics I could um, and, yeah, just, and talk to Fiona about that as well. It was just important to try and help me understand what drives her because I guess the thing that, I've always noticed about Fiona is her courage. She'll say the things that other people are thinking, but won't say it. But she'll not just say it to friends, she'll say it in front of a forum or a workshop or a oh, um, right. so that, that, that has the potential to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. So, and Fiona keeps doing that and keeps stepping up and, you know, doesn't always make her friends. Um, often it's the opposite. So it's a lot of, a lot of courage to keep keeping that ball to keep pushing that barrow. Um, so the book is structured thematically rather than chronologically, which creates a sort of indeterminate sense of time, the kind of when to use the title of an exhibition back by an Indigenous curator and arts administrator, Bruce Johnson McLean. Would each of you comment on this kind of alternative understanding of time that seems to run through the book? Well, I guess I started with the themes of, in the work and just really tried to pull in the material that related to that. And then it's a hard thing. Um, it's, it, I guess with the book, I followed the heat. Um, I didn't, I'm not the way I write is not to build a skeleton and then fill in the gaps because I did, I've you know, done workshops with me to do that. And for me, once I've built the skeleton, I'm not interested anymore. So <laughs> I just had to follow the heat of, of what, of the art that was, had been made, the things that came out of it, and then the material that spoke to that. So it's much more. Um, Intuitive than cerebral, probably. It's um, it really just um, yeah, coalesced. Let's say, yeah, no, it's probably a culmination of one controversy after another. <laughs> no, no chronological order. Oh, remember when she did that? When she did that? She did that. <laughs> and also, you know, fairly early on, this talks about you going through and introducing her to the old people. So there's this kind of sense that the past is present and that comes through, I think. Yeah, we, we talk about, you know, um, all Indigenous culture in this country is living and breathing. So when growing up, every time we went to Gari, we had a sense the old people were watching. So you never escape that. So you introduce someone new into your culture. So it's, and we do talk out loud to our old people when we go back to country and we announce ourselves to them and say, you know, I'm, I'm coming back. Every, every time I'm in the car and I greet them, I move from um, Gubby Gubby country into Butchler country, there's a particular mountain that's on our boundary, which is um, Bobble Mountain, not Bobble Mountain, yeah, Bobble Mountain. And um, I look across to Bobble Mountain and I say, I'm home, old people. 
you know, and I say that out loud and um, I would probably say that out loud if someone's sitting in the car as well. So it's, it's and I, I go to other people's country and they talk to their old people as well. So we're aware that, you know, those people are never far and they're watching over us all the time. Thank you. Yana, I was struck by the fact that you had no one as a role model when you were a young student at the East Sydney Technical College back in the early 1980s. And your lecturers were not indigenous and they weren't particularly sympathetic to your ideas. And the iconography of your bachelor people had been largely lost to colonisation. But as you say, there's the genetics of many child were obviously one source of that information. In a way, what you've done and continue to do with, for example, your protest to the absence of Indigenous representation at the 1985 Australian Sector, um, the founding of the Bumali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative, the development of your own work and your teaching has been to pave the way for the Indigenous artists to come after you. Would you tell us a little bit about those experiences? Well, I'm in that first wave of, you know, urban Aboriginal artists from Sydney who um, we really did start an art movement in this country that's not really well acknowledged or identified and that's through the Mali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative and we were going through separate institutions some had already studied it, it used to be called Alexander Mackey and it has a different name um, what's it called now? COFA, COFA, oh, College of Fine Art. College of Fine Art. Yeah. So two of the members had already um, done their BAs, Jeffrey Samuels and Raymond Meeks, who was, who was, had a name change, Jerome Meeks. And then there was a bunch of us going through um, Sydney College of the Arts. And um, so it was a very dynamic time and I was, I was still an art student and I was invited into Korea 84, um, curated by Tim Johnson and Vivian Johnson at Art Space. And that was the first group exhibition I was in, but that was a um, very um, monumental shift in inviting various Aboriginal artists to be a part of this exhibition. So there was a mixture of urban-based Sydney artists and also traditional artists who were living in um, Sydney. And some of the artists were also going to the oral, the TAFE centre and being educated there. So um, I got to meet some of the artists like uh, Michael Riley that night, um, Euphemia Bostock, Fernanda Martins. And then as time was travelling along, um, I also got to go to Ramangini Arts and craft in Arnhem Land and see how the community was operating there under John Mundine, who was the first Indigenous curator at, at, uh, at that time, and he was the first Indigenous curator for a long period of time before, like, the second wave of curators were coming through institutions where but the Mali had to agitate for that so that... Um, those state institutions would have um, programs and um, employment of an Indigenous curator. And that didn't come easily because it wasn't handed to us on a platter. We had to agitate for a lot of different roads into um, the Aboriginal art world, the Aboriginal art market. And we had to be fairly um, strident about that and set up our own cooperative in Maastricht, Chippendale. So it was a context where there were no people that we could lean on because we were the first. So I couldn't go to a older Aboriginal woman as a mentor because there was none. So when I reflect back now, you know, I'm teaching at Queensland College of Art, Griffith University, I'm seeing the product of third and fourth generation Aboriginal art, young budding artists and people establishing careers from the wave of um, strategic thinking and instrumental in a way that we targeted institutions like the Art Gallery of New South Wales, like the Sydney University, the Power Institute, where we advocated 
we need to be included in big international shows like RHR that toured to three countries. They weren't going to put Southeast uh, artists in, in the frame. And Michael Riley and I would attend those meetings and agitate for inclusion of urban based Aboriginal artists. And that's something that younger people today are not aware of their history. And so that's to their detriment. And that's why this publication is so important because it talks about some of that earlier period where we were making inroads. So, I mean, these so called publications had a point. And point is we're actually seeing the results of that now which is which is fantastic um in a sense Louise your book is semi-autobiographical in that you reflect on your life in contrast to Pianos say for example in terms of connection to country so has it been a personal journey for you as well um yeah I, yeah, I don't know if this writing always is has that component to it um and part of that kind of creative nonfiction style that I thought would suit this material means that you kind of have to, it's, it's kind of, it's me, but it's not me, you know, it's an, a character you build to put into that um, context, but it obviously reflects my experiences um, with women in the country and, um, you know, just my own kind of much more. Um, unsettled connection um, to the places where I've lived. I mean, because you, you both did move around a lot when you were younger, and the difference was that you, know, you were lucky to have that base to go back to. So, Gary was sort of this place you would know, return to, and the people that you lived in that kind of gave you that touch point, I suppose, and connected into the future. Uh, so a related question for both of you, in a way, has, how has the process of writing and contributing to the biography influenced the way that you work? Has it so helped? Well, for me, um, I've, been more, I've been kind of exploring this idea of writing more biographically about artists, just to kind of basically get a bigger audience, get more people involved with art, um, more people understanding its importance and how interesting it is and what it reflects about the times that we're living through. So um, the opportunity of the PhD with other feedback was fantastic um, just to be able to have you know to build a bigger, bigger text and have more constant feedback um, critique and some of people to push you, you know, got to be pushed out of your comfort zone in a way. Um, so it's been really a great project. I'm really thrilled that QT Art Museum published it um, and that it's getting, you know, that you're all, you're all here to hear about it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, has it influenced your thinking or just going back through time and reflecting on things that have happened, will that feed into your work in any way, do you think? I'll never do another bibliography. <laughs> 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 um, you <run> your <laughs> No, I think it, it's fantastic what Louise has done. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to do to sort of write about someone's life and still remain friends after the event, you know, it's... Um, it's just a difficult path to navigate. And um, she's seen, Louise has seen me in so many different situations over my career that she could plot that course through the publication. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge success to her skill as a writer. And she's drawn out some valuable information for people who are interested in understanding um, more urban-based Aboriginal artists and also urban-based Aboriginal artists who use their voice for change and who provoke and want to challenge the status quo. So I think she's captured that. And um, I, think the, I think the book's a huge success. And so finally, what's next for both of you? What's on the agenda? Well, I, I've sort of got more into writing and I think that's been a change. I'm not a confident writer. Um, 
I never have been. I don't think I ever will be, and I struggle with writing. Uh, but oh, having won that award recently is riding the clouds, I think. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's, well, I'm still not confident, but anyway, so um, I think there's the potential to do another book for me and, in, you know, while I'm at the Academy. So I just see a career in the Academy at a university, Griffiths Uni, for 10 years, and I'd like to do another book. And for me, um, well, you know, my, I've got a freelance practice which is busy, but I really would like to. Um, I've got some other projects, bigger projects that I would need to um, get some more time to that. Can't in time out to do that. Well, thank you so much for talking this evening. We'll now hand back to Chrissy for some questions from the audience. So yeah, we've got um, some time for questions from the audience um, and also for the people on Zoom. Um, if you want to type your questions in now, they'll be texted to me out here. So you will see um, the power of Zoom in action. Um, so please feel free to type them into that chat bar. But um, I'll just take anything from the audience here. Has anyone got any questions for Fiona or Louise? Yes. I first found your work as the Black Opium piece of the
story. And I walked away there thinking I have to tell this story in the CBD of Mackay. And um, she talked about remembering her grandmother when she was a young girl and the grandmother had indentations on both her ankles because she ran away from a sugarcane farm. They hunted her down on horseback, brought her back to that sugarcane property and shackled her, but the shackles were too tight and that's why she had indentations for the rest of her life on both her ankles. So that was a story that an oral story told to me and, I, and Mackay also has the largest South Sea Islander community in all of Australia. And I wanted these hidden histories is what I principally work with through public art and I wanted that to be in the um, CBD. So there was some councillors, we had a big council meeting about it, who were for it and some who were against it. So the only way we could get that particular project up was if I also named boats that didn't bring human cargo. And I said, okay, you can have two of those boats, but the rest will be named. Um, actually, because um, I work in the number seven a lot, there were seven columns, so I actually ended up doing seven boats that didn't bring human cargo. So I was generous in my <laughs> working <laughs> relationship with them. Wow. Are there any other questions from people here? I have to admit, I run events with famous authors all the time and I'm incredibly starstruck because yes. um, I came across your art uh, a while ago and it has been incredibly influential on me. So um, it's such a great privilege to be running this event. Um, so um, other people who are not so tongue-tied, yes. <laughs> um, you just mentioned the number seven. How, you know, what other ways is that? Well, so I didn't realise that I was using seven a lot in the work that I do. And so someone pointed that out. And even like to the point where um, a lot of reviews are on page 17 or seven, you know, so seven pops up a lot, right? And then so numerolo you know, in numerology, you, could, you do your numbers in life and I'm like a number seven in numerology. And so sevens apparently are teachers. So I think that's at the core of what I am. I teach and through my art I teach and it's like a big thing that is very important to me because all of the research I do, I use art as a vehicle or a platform to talk about these hidden histories. Um, I've got too many questions. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'm curious, firstly, uh, when you got to Alexander Mackie, was that during the Whitlam era of free education? Was that you were another one of those people who got the foot into education through that era. Um, a lot of your work that I've seen has, uh, has to me, is seriously feminist bent to it. So I'm wondering about that influence through the 80s and 90s in that work as you're telling the stories that you do. And I similarly come to your work through the state library. Um, We've had a group up here, and I'm not sure exactly when they started, but our proper now more. And I'm just wondering if there's if the, the group that you were involved in in Sydney, what was there? Were they contemporary or different? And did they have a connection? <laughs> yeah, that's enough. I went to um, Sydney College of the Arts. I didn't go to COFA. So I did come through the era of free education under. Whitlam government, so forever grateful, sing his praises, um, think he did a fantastic job. So I never had to pay a hex fee. So I'm one of those people. Um, and, you know, indebted to Gough Whitlam for that. Um, the second question about the Mali and Proper Now and what sequence there was. I'll do the feminist feminist one first. I usually don't identify as a feminist, but as I'm getting older, I'm realising that it has very strong feminist elements. So I'm all about talking um, 
truth to power through the reading that I've done in terms of like how Aboriginal women are treated historically in this country. So I do do a lot of work related to like black velvet um, and I'm writing more in that space than trying to collate that information. And um, there was, a, you know, so part of my research was there was a whole language invented in Australia with um, colonial men who had uh, invented words for Aboriginal women and how they would interact with them. So it was all of a sexual nature of, you know, kidnapping, abducting, uh, raping, um, taking by force. And so that also leads into the breakdown of Aboriginal society where they would have been promised wives to Aboriginal men and that sort of ruptures that. So I do work in that space and I'm trying to own my, you know, feminism a lot more instead of just saying I'm an Aboriginal artist. In terms of proper now, the Mali started in 1987 and now came on the scene in about 2004. So there's a huge gap. And the problem I have with proper now is that they don't ever acknowledge Finale Aboriginal artists. And so that was a recently this year in an article in The Guardian where Richard Bell is very dismissive of the inroads that were made with Bamali and maybe there's some sexism there. So I'm just putting it out there because there were seven women in Bamali and three men. Now, Proper Now is heavily male dominated and I've had conversations with Rich and Bell a number of years ago. Now we, he would refer to Bamali as petticoat fascists. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so, have we got it? Doesn't say anything about that sexism. <laughs> we got any other? That's a question here. I've got your the first biography that was written about you, and Louis uh, has mentioned it, and that's about twenty years ago, I think. And now, are you writing a diary for the next twenty years? And you get another three autobiography? <laughs> 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 Oh, I don't know. You know, life's a funny thing, isn't it? Um, you can never really predict the future. And as a good colleague of mine says, John Mundine, just he always says, just keep working. And that's all I do think, you know, just keep working. Can I ask Louise, what was the most difficult thing about writing this book for you? What did you find most difficult? Most difficult? Um, Probably the ethical clearance process for the university. <laughs> you get to that, you get to it. Yeah. Which was confronting because I guess I was, I was very naive, but worked with Aboriginal artists for such a long time. And Fiona was university educated, and the kinds of things I just didn't, I didn't understand that they were appropriate, that, you know, that was important to us, Fiona's community in um, Harvey Bay and um, Gary about involvement with this and you know as you know from mixed settler descendants um we have a much more um individualistic view of ourselves and um you know there's no way I would ask yeah and people would add to me that's something that I wanted to do but that just to really understand it actually helped me understand the power of connections in um Aboriginal communities in a way that I really didn't um, and it took me a long time to really come to terms with what they were asking me to do and to actually understand that it was appropriate. And was that relaxed because you, the book is not an academic work specifically? Does well, that, was that relaxed a bit in one that? One of my supervisors was saying actually, you know, you're in the creative learning department, we should have some creative freedoms. Why should we do that? But because of the way everything is in the academy, I think it was appropriate, um, and his advice probably was not the best advice. Um, one of my other supervisors probably had a much better handle of that. Um, so yeah, that was, but that was an important part of my education. Just any final question from the audience? 
How I feel about what? Uh, like I've always felt about it. <laughs> like there's a deep love there, you know. Much of people have a real deep love for our traditional country. And so there is a deep love. There's a deep uh, frustration with the amount of tourists that go there. And um, it's, there's a schism because we go there as traditional landowners for that country, but we sometimes feel like tourists in our own country by the way we're treated. So, for instance, if you go to Mackenzie Lake, there are, you know, a hundred people swimming on that, that beautiful white sand and beautiful aqua waters. And it's just like, how do we escape these tourists? And it's like, so when we go there, we either go very early in the morning to escape them or we go way, 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 way left of where they're all on that bank. And it's just like, uh, it's such a compromise to go there now. And that's what I find really challenging and hard to deal with. But the love for the place is, you know, like, it's like a relative. Deep. Um, so I've been there once before, I went with Fiona, so obviously I had a very different experience of the island and um, it's incredibly beautiful, you know, there's huge trees at Central Station and, you know, obviously it's World Heritage and Spirit Rainforest. There's a lot of it that I haven't seen and probably I won't ever see, um, but that's appropriate to, you know, it's, 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 it's not my place, but it was just such a privilege to go there with you and have a, that other experience. I did just get a question off Zoom as well. So before we finish, um, is it Paola uh, Bala? Do you know if that's how you say yeah. Paola? Paola? Paola Bala has asked, um, has said, thank you for this important conversation and all of your work in leadership. Um, as our first wave of black urban artists, Fiona, if you do write another book, would you address the patriarchy and sexism in black men's art and depictions of us as black women? Is that something that you would ever take on in your writing? No, it's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> How about in your artwork? Um, I, I'm more interested in, um, with Paola asking that question, I'm more interested in supporting Indigenous women. So I want to encourage Indigenous female scholarship and the way I can do that is through symposiums and writing, uh, asking people to present papers if I have, you know, an opportunity or selecting them to curate an exhibition of mine like Angelina Hurley recently or, you know. Um, so I see Aboriginal, I'm um, encouraging them to participate a lot more in events that I'm able to um, in, invite them into. So that could be a speaking gig, that could be a writing gig, it could be a curatorial gig, uh, or it could be simply networking and mentoring. Well, like with Amy uh, Maguire, whom I'm mentoring for an issue of Griffith Review next year. So that's where my focus is, is, is being really hands-on and encouraging and supporting Indigenous women coming through the academy. Fantastic. That's really special and great work. So thank you very much for that. And look, thank you very much for the conversation, Samantha, that you've had tonight to bring up some um, really important elements that are there in the book. And thank you very much, Louise, for writing the book um, and also for participating in the book, Fiona. Um, I'd like to um, just thank you with a round of applause.
and now is the time that you can grab another drink and um, grab a book and you can get them signed. And we also have um, Fiona's award-winning book at the counter as well if you want to grab that too. So um, we've, we've got a table set up here. Um, I'll grab you guys a glass of wine so you can relax now. Um, please feel free to um, go in. The books are front and centre at the counter. The bar is open and join us back here for signing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.